soulmates, we are back at it. Some of you may be in uh, recovery <laughs> from from yesterday, the big love day. Yes. Uh -huh. How was your Valentine's Day? It was good. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a doozy because it's it's Valentine's Day. It's my husband's birthday. And and what? Well, now today is birthday Eve. Oh yeah, it's birthday. For somebody's yeah. Courtney Hicks Lanier. That's why guys used to break up with me. It was too much. It was too much back to back to back. But the husband hung on in there, and now he's the husband. And so yeah, I was definitely on duty last night, honey. <laughs> <laughs> on duty? Is that what we call it? Yeah. How about you? Uh, I celebrated Valentine's Day in Denver with Montre this weekend. Okay. Yeah. So you did a pre-Valentine's Day. We did a pre-Valentine's Day, Aww. and we had a good time. As long as you get it in. Yeah. All right. That's right. That works. Yeah. All right. We have plenty to talk about on this. Uh, Wednesday, February 15th, including updates on the gunman from MSU, plant, plus an officer that's been arrested in Georgia for the death of a teenage girl. Welcome to Fox Souls Black Report. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm Nicole Delay Corte. We also have the details behind the New Jersey expansion of black history courses and the policy that could have a major impact on transgender mm. sports. It's the stories that impact our people. We are ready to bring you our news, our views, and our voice. So let's get into the conversation. And we start with the father of the gunman who killed three students at Michigan State University. He says his son turned evil and mean after his mother's death. It's being said that Anthony McRae, uh, seen here, changed his demeanor and outlook on life after his mom died suddenly of a stroke. This happened back in September of 2020. His dad went on to say that Anthony was a mama's boy and the two were very, very close best friends and that uh, after she died, he quit his warehouse job and he stayed home and pretty much played video games all day. And uh, the father, uh, Nicole Light, even went as far to say as it was more like a brother and sister relationship. Mm -hmm. I remember yesterday reading in on what the sister uh, had to say, and uh, she said she hadn't seen her brother uh, since the funeral of their mother back in 2020. And what makes this even more so sad, the, the father is a man of God. He really tried to um, uh, have a handle on, on the mental state uh, of his son, um, suggesting that he get up, get out, come with me to church, you know, apply for new jobs, find new opportunities. And uh, he was totally unaware that his son was involved until FBI came, you know, swarming his residence. You know, which uh, is Monday night, which is interesting because uh, there were neighbors that said that they saw uh, the perpetrator uh, engaged in uh, in he was target practicing practice, target yeah. practice in the mm -hmm. backyard. And mm -hmm. so, you know, how could his father not know anything? And I just just think this brings new meaning to see something say something, mm -hmm. do something, right? And I mean, this is really strange behavior that has uh, commenced over the course of the past couple years. Yeah. And so, you know, as I was reading this, I was thinking, well, you know, who sits there and lets their son just sort of play video games for two years following, you know, the death of their mom, mm -hmm. right? Well, according to the reports, he was trying to motivate, he was trying to get him out, apply for new jobs. He wanted him to get up, get out, go to church. So I feel like the father was making an effort, but by this time, you know, this is a grown son, uh, you know, on his own path and, and making those uh, type of choices. So I think, you know, if you want to, you can blame the dad all day. I, I think um, the key is this, this man's uh, decline. Um, um, and, and how it unfortunately uh, played out. And I think it, what is so heartbreaking and, and what really um, just stings for me is that because he did take his own life, um, you know, it may be hard to find or maybe we'll never find a connection as to why. You know, aside from maybe anger, you can conclude some things from the reports that, that, that keep coming out, but, but, but really why? I know people were asking, you know, um, what's the connection? Was he a student? Was there some sort of affiliation? And right now, uh, police still have no idea. Uh, the dad did say or, or hint to that uh, his son uh, was maybe trying to apply for a job at Michigan State University. Uh, that wasn't quite clear, but that was uh, in some of the reports that have recently come out. So I think some we're just going to have to um, maybe be at peace with never really knowing, unfortunately. Well, I mean, but I, I still think the investigation is only beginning. And so I'm sure there, there's a lot more that, that we can learn from this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, just last month, uh, the Michigan governor, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, had called for a whole package of uh, police reforms, including red flag laws, which, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. who knows, might have made a difference in this case. And so uh, moving uh, from what's happening here in Michigan to what's happening in Buffalo, the long overdue sentencing of the Buffalo gunman finally took place this week and the shooter actually apologized in court. Now, his name is Peyton Gendron and he's 18 years old. He stood up, 
and he said he was remorseful and regrets all the decisions he made leading up to the shooting in May. Now, Peyton, is, he's going to serve in prison, but said looking back, he can't believe he actually killed those people. Mm. He said he believed what he read online and acted out of hate. Now, Courtney, I don't know about you, but it's really hard for me to accept this apology. And I know my faith tells me to forgive, mm. to forgive, but this one, is, it's going to take me some time. So I can only imagine how the families feel. And, and uh, uh, also, there's, there's some guilt that lies with the social media companies because for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, there have been a lot of activists and advocates that have said that these platforms are being misused to spread misinformation and disinformation and radicalize people uh, around white supremacy ideology. And we haven't seen these social media companies um, be held to account regarding that. And so you have the killer that actually says in court, mm -hmm. I can't believe I did that. Yeah, um, a far stretch from where he was when he first committed these uh, heinous acts because he was very defiant. Uh, he was very intentional. Uh, he he cased those uh, that particular store and other stores uh, in Buffalo. He cased that neighborhood. So, you know, fast forward to today where you've been sentenced uh, for life. Uh, cut it with the tears. I don't I don't I don't I don't want to hear the tears. You know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not there just yet. And, and I'm not even a family member or part of that community. That would be very hard for me to digest. As a matter of fact, uh, in the courtroom, uh, while uh, the victims families uh, were giving, you know, their say so on it, um, this young man was actually charged by, I do believe, a family member of, of one of the victims. So uh, there's still a lot of anger uh, aside, uh, 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 coupled, if you will, with the hurt. And uh, I think, um, you know, OK, so you apologize, but I don't think it's enough. I don't think it'll ever be enough. And I don't think people are ready for the apology. I, I, I sure wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And, and all I could think about. And the tears. He had were, tears. Were, were, were the, the 10 souls whose mm -hmm. lives were cut short yeah. Uh, you know, because he decided that they didn't deserve to live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Heartbreaking. All right, so let's go from Buffalo to Mississippi, uh, where there are several white officers. They are under investigation for lying on two black men, saying they were selling drugs and, get this, dating white women before placing them under arrest. Michael C. Jenkins and Eddie Terrell Parker were at a home when six officers raided that home without a warrant. The cops brutally tortured the men with one of the officers shooting one of the men in the mouth. Now that could end up uh, being attempted murder charges as this case and this investigation moves along. Now reports also say the officers even waterboarded the two men and one witness even described the officers participating in a taser contest of the men. And back to that officer shooting uh, one of those victims in the mouth. He actually had to have his tongue removed, oh so he could not talk, and he has to, you know, communicate via writing. Uh, those victims were on uh, life support. Uh, when you talk about waterboarding, that is a, 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 a torture technique where you are uh, restrained and uh, water is poured on your head, and, and just the way you're positioned, you feel as though if you're going to drown to sort of kind of uh, force you into some sort of confession. And that act of torture has even been outlawed by the U.S. Uh, government after they found that soldiers were using using those techniques in Iraq. So so maybe that hints to maybe these officers having some quote, some sort of military uh, background, but an absolute outcry. Uh, you know, I'm glad that we're able to share this story because I, people are, are not aware because I think this should be on the forefront. Uh, I know these men have survived their injuries, thank God, but this should be on the forefront of, of everybody's mind, much in the likeness of the Tyree Nichols case. That's right, and also much in, in the likes of Emmett Till. It really conjured up mm -hmm. memories for me mm -hmm. of Emmett Till. Here we, here we go in Mississippi mm -hmm. again. I think, you know, Nina, Nina Simone has a song, Mississippi, oh, Mississippi. GD, right? <laughs> now, that's exactly where, where I went with this. And this is just a reminder of mm -hmm. just how critical the ban on no-knock warrants mm -hmm. are in this push for nationwide police reform. You know, everybody's always talking about the training. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need more training for officers, mm -hmm. right? What was it in the training that said that any one of these techniques was legal, mm -hmm. that any one of these techniques was acceptable, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, how can we just sort of stand by and we, we allow this, this, this really heinous 
misuse of, of, yeah. of authority and this overuse of force. Yeah. How can we allow this to stand? For me, it's not even a talk of training. This is going back to the Nichols case. It's, it's not, it's not uh, white, it's not black. For, for me right now, at this point, it's about blue and the culture. And this is like the wild, wild west, or in this case, being in Mississippi, the wild, wild south. And these officers feeling they have the license to be judge, jury, and as you quite often say, executioner, uh, all in one, in one swoop here. And so that culture is going to have to continue to be criticized, reimagined. Uh, you know, we're going to have to continue to politic when it comes to the policies and find a new way of policing because this ain't it. There's a black man it. in America today that does not have a tongue. Yeah. Does not have a tongue to use mm -hmm. because these officers made it their business to harass and um, and, and, and Take harm him, him in the most heinous That's of ways. Right. And so uh, we'll continue to keep our eye on that story. But moving on to Georgia, where a young 22-year-old officer in Georgia has been fired and arrested for hiding the death of a 16-year-old. Susanna Morales has been missing since July of last year, and her body was finally found near a highway this week. Well, evidence led to officers uh, that uh, were charged uh, in Miles Bryant uh, uh, with, with falsely reporting a crime and concealing the death of another. On the night Morales was last seen alive, she texted her mom uh, that she was on her way home and clearly mm. she didn't make it home. You know, it, these uh, stories are absolutely heartbreaking and that's why it's so important. I think, you know, once they break for us, uh, you know, news agencies like ourselves to circle back around so we can continue to get out the details, continue to get out the information because somebody somewhere knows something and you always say, if you say something, see something. And do something. And, and do something. And just think about how many um, cases go unsolved or how many families are still tortured by not knowing what has happened uh, to their loved ones, even even though uh, the story may not end the way that they would want it to end. But this is why it's so important to circle back around to these stories and, and make sure that proper information is put out there. Yeah, and, and, and the fact that this family, for six months, mm -hmm. didn't know what happened to their baby girl. That's right. That's you know, right. and you think that the law enforcement is on your side, right? But the idea that law enforcement might have been in cahoots mm -hmm. with, with whoever harmed her, uh, that shouldn't sit well with any of us. At all. All right, could uh, the White House see could the White House see another brother adding to the growing list of Republicans hoping to grab the office next year is South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Now, Scott hasn't uh, made too much of an official announcement just yet, but there are reports close to his camp, inside his camp, around his camp, saying he's gearing up to toss his hat in the uh, presidential ring. Now, for years, Scott has been considered um, heavy for the presidency. He's got the look, he's got the, the resume. He was the 2021 Republican nominee who was selected to answer Biden's address, you may remember, to Congress. And um, look, he's always been one of those ones who's been out there um, in consideration, you know, having the look, having the say so, having the color. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with, with that's, hel that's helpful among some Republicans, know, but not other Republicans, particularly the MAGA Republicans. I know, but, but with but with you know Republicans want to you know, wanting to push a particular agenda and and make it a lot more colorful to maybe appeal uh, to other type of voters, the voters that we all know that they have just ignored from election to election. Uh, maybe this time around, with uh, some of them trying to get away from Trump, maybe uh, Tom might be their guy this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Tim Scott, you know, Tim, may, may, you know, may be their their guy, uh, but uh, I think he he might be used to excuse uh, the calls for racial justice that uh, the Republican Party has been absolutely tone deaf mm -hmm. deaf on. I just want to also remind our soulmates that Tim Scott uh, was the leading Republican that was supposed to be negotiating the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act mm -hmm. in the Senate, uh, and it never quite got over the finish line. And so he's going to have some explain 
planning to do on the campaign trail if he wants a shot at the Republican nomination yeah, for president. Yeah, but early on he's saying he wants you know, us to come together and he wants to create opportunity. So he's already starting in on what, what he feels his agenda should be in, in hopes of, of, you know, bringing that Republican Party together. But we shall see. We shall see. Yes. Well, speaking of uh, what we're seeing, uh, now we go to Texas. We're members of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. They're calling out Florida's governor for saying that diversity hiring causes discrimination. That's right. You heard it right. They say the claims in the memo are not true and that the policies are helpful in creating a level playing field for minorities in the workplace. The caucus says this is a political stunt to attract extreme right wing support for a possible presidential run. What say ye? Water <laughs> is wet. <laughs> Water is say. wet. This is obvious. This is obvious. And, and, and it's no surprise that, you know, from Florida mm -hmm. to South Carolina to Texas, all red states, right? They, they all seem to Very be red. on this reverse discrimination tip, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, going after uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, really declaring war on black history. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think we can expect them to turn up the volume. You know, uh, just earlier today, I had a conversation with... Uh, uh, Representative Jim Clyburn, uh, and he's going to uh, talk a whole lot more about that on my Sunday show on KBLA on Sunday. Oh, but wow. he had a lot to say about this and more. All right, let's move on here. Let's go to Tennessee, uh, where State Representative Justin Pearson was recently criticized for wearing a dashiki on his first day at work, saying it was to honor the ancestors. Now, State Representative David Hawk, he's a Republican, tweeted on the importance of appearance and other representatives had mixed reactions. Uh, Pearson plans to wear traditional African clothing with a tie and a jacket if necessary, while Representative Karen Camper call this a learning moment. Sound like she's trying to bring the peace. Now, the Tennessee House has no dress code, but the event has prompted questions about whether black uh, folks should be punished for wearing traditional African clothing to work. A big debate on tap here. This is this is a part of the war on black folks. And the culture. Right? This is, this is exactly what this is all about, mm -hmm. you know, and Republicans are saying the quiet part out loud. Mm -hmm. As you reported, there's no dress code, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. They want to enforce a standard. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no standard, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, he's not wearing anything inappropriate. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier. There, you know, there are other garments yeah, that the, people wear across cultures. What, what came to mind for me was, you know, is there a problem when someone wears a yarmulke or a turban or a, or a hijab? Um, aren't those along the same lines as far as I'm concerned? And so why not the uproar? I mean, and these have been traditionally worn, you know, throughout the years, um, whether they be in an official setting or, or informal. So I'm wondering, you know, if, if you're going to have a problem with one, you're going to have to have a problem with all of them. And so it makes it very fishy and dicey when there's a problem with one particular uh, set of clothing that's assigned to a particular culture. Mm -hmm. That's where I have the problem. Well, yeah. well, uh, New Jersey governor says, you know, he don't want no problems around AP <laughs> Black History in his state. If only Florida could take a page out of the New Jersey uh, uh, playbook. The state is looking to expand their Black History courses for students. Next year, 26 schools will offer the AP class and only one offered it this year as a part of a pilot program. So New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy says that New Jersey will proudly teach our kids that black history is American history. That's all we've been saying. Hats the whole off. Time to Governor Murphy, he gets it. He does. This is not, this doesn't have to be that difficult. And we need to hear from more uh, politicians, you know, come from behind this, you know, this mask here. And, you know, if this is the way you feel, we kind of got into this debate yesterday, if this is the way you feel, take a stand. I mean, uh, we need to hear from more uh, politicians who, who feel this way or know they should be feeling this way to speak up and say, no, this isn't right. No, we need to, you know, let's, let's equally divide the, the, the piece of the pie, you know, and learn about everybody's history and be inclusive and understand that black history is American history. I mean, how many times do we have to do we have to claim it? Mm -hmm. How many times do we have to claim and it? And especially white politicians and allies. That's right. Be an ally. That's right. All right. Uh, Georgia, Not a lie. <laughs> Georgia Republicans are pushing for a statue 
of U.S. Supreme Court, Justice Clarence Thomas, to be erected on the state capitol grounds. They trying it. De Democrats, especially uh, black ones, see it as an insensitive display of partisan power. The Senate voted 32 to 20 along party lines to mandate the statue. Savannah Republican Senator Ben Watson argues that Thomas deserves a place of honor. But Senator Nan Oreck, Oreck says his service is problematic, citing his confirmation amid Anita Hill's testimony and his rulings on the Supreme Court. Now, they also criticized Thomas's wife for her involvement in the 2020 election uh, in grown folks business and, and, and how left she took that situation. Uh, look, can we separate, uh, you know, policy from the accomplishments? Is he still, you know, an accomplished, you know, man that would, you know, deserve a, a statue? Can you separate uh, the two? Because, you know, you have folks like Ben Carson, you have folks mm. like um, her, the late Herman Cain, mm. who have some incredible stories, who were very accomplished men who came, you know, from, from, from very um, tough backgrounds and were able to succeed and be, because they align themselves with certain policies or they feel a certain way or they align themselves with a certain politician, namely Trump, do they not deserve to be recognized for their accomplishments let me cut to the chase okay have you ever seen the movie Django Unchained the Django yeah you, with the with with Jamie, Jamie Foxx Fox and yeah. Samuel L. Jackson you Django. remember Samuel L. Jackson's character <laughs> You remember Stephen? You think that's what this? Well, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, saying, but want, I'm not they, debating if, that. If they erected a statue of Stephen from Django right mm -hmm. next to Clarence Thomas's statue, I would not be surprised. But I'm not. Well, listen, I'm talking about their accomplishments. I'm talking about would, sure. would they still be deemed as as figures, as as accomplished men, you know, for there to be some sort of uh, you know recognizing of their accomplishments. Uh, you know, embodied in a statue. I Aside think, from what you disagree about is what I'm saying. I think history will remember certain folks fondly and mm -hmm. other folks not so fondly. And, you know, sure, put up the statue of Clarence Thomas and uh, see, put his record out there. I don't, I don't think future generations mm -hmm. are going to celebrate him the way that, uh, you know, the, this Republican-controlled con legislature in Georgia thinks that people will. But sure, go ahead. If you want to put him up <laughs> as your mascot, go ahead. <laughs> You like it. Some people love it. <laughs> Not you. We know. Moving on. For suspects having been arrested in Florida for their alleged role in the assassination of uh, the Haitian president, um, the suspects include Antonio Intriego, Arcangel Pratel Ortiz, Walter Ventimilla, and Frederick Bergman. The investigation focuses on weapons, ballistic vests, and financing used in the plot. The assassination was, has, it has, it's emboldened gangs in Haiti, leading to increased violence and political turmoil. Now, the latest arrests come a day before a conference on Haiti by the Caribbean bloc, uh, CARICOM. And, you know, mm. uh, I've got to say, there has been a lot happening in Haiti. We've been tracking this so story much. very closely. Uh, the adoption of Haitian kids has been held up uh, in the uh, U.S. State Department. Basically, they're not processing these these uh, 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 adoptions fast enough. Uh, that is an issue. And so for people uh, over at the uh, U.S. State Department that are working mm -hmm. on this, you mm -hmm. know, we're looking at you. Mm -hmm. You all got to do better uh, uh, to prioritize these kids. It's within U.S. policy to prioritize uh, these adoptions. And, and they're not doing it. And, you know, these gangs have really taken over oh, Haiti. You know, the record number the of country. murders mm -hmm. and rapes. And so there's a lot of instability there. Uh, and, you know, for all the folks out there that act like Haitians are not deserving mm -hmm. of seeking asylum mm -hmm. in the U.S. and other places, you know, take a look uh, at what is happening there. And so it is a step forward mm -hmm. uh, that they have found some of the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators, but they need to do, we need to do more. But they have to see the worth. They have to see the worth in that beautiful, beautiful island, the rich history, the legacy, and they have to see the worth. And once they see the worth, then the goal and the mission is to help Haiti. Yeah. Yeah. They need help. Yeah. Help Haiti. All right, coming up, a new study is showing what younger black Americans are doing with their spare time. That's right. We'll tell you all about it when we return. You're watching Fox Soul's Black Report. So back to that statue of uh, old boy. Steven. <laughs>